Good morning, this is day 55 and the uh, second instalment in our discussion of John's Gospel. Um, let me say a little bit about uh, how John has organised his Gospel because he, as with so many of the other biblical writers, is a really skillful um, if I say artist, please don't misunderstand me. I don't mean to, to lessen this by referring to it as art, but but to um, say it's even more wonderful than sometimes we notice because it is high art in terms of the beautiful way it's constructed and the artful way, the skillful way it's constructed. Um, so it begins, as you almost certainly know, with John's prologue, the first 14 verses. And we're going to have a little look at that in more detail in a few minutes, um, perhaps the most glorious piece of prose um, in the Bible and maybe the most glorious piece of prose ever written, uh, in my opinion. Um, then the book proper, as it were, gets underway in 1 verse 15. And uh, 1 verse 15 to 12 verse 50 is um, commonly thought of as considered to be what's known as the book of signs. So there are a number of signs uh, given to show what Jesus is. And John uses the language of sign quite a lot. I'll come back to that in a minute. So those, um, uh, so that part kind of stands together. And then from 13 verse 1 onwards, this is what's known as the book of glory. And glory is an important theme in John's gospel, as I will show you. Um, but listen to 13 verse 1, when he seems to kind of turn a, a corner, as it were. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then we get um, the... Uh, we get the, 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 the Last Supper discourse and we get the washing of the disciples feet and we get obviously the passion narratives and the, the, the uh, crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. So that broadly speaking, that's this is the kind of the, the large scale structure of the book. Now, woven through this, then we have um, some, um, some some who have seven, um, several lots of sevens. So one of the things well known um, this is, is that we have seven I am's. John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never hunger. and The one who believes in me will never thirst. John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 10, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, they will be saved. John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, though they may die, they shall live. John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 15 verse 1, I am the true vine. So we have these seven I am sayings. We also have seven signs woven through the gospel. Um, now, what is a sign? Um, John makes explicit what I think the synoptic writers um, assume um, and expect us to assume, but John makes it a little clearer. So John uses um, the language of sign. Um, the, uh, the Greek word is semeion. Um, a sign is, um, I'm quoting from one of the um, technical dictionaries here, an event that is an indication or confirmation of intervention by transcendent powers, miracle or portent. In other words, it is not just a miracle, but it is a pointer. It indicates something. It is supposed to draw our attention to the inbreaking by God. Um, so these um, the healings and things that Jesus does are not um, just miracles, um, but they're signs that point us to who Jesus really is. And we're intended to um, see, see beyond them to uh, what they are showing us. Um, in fact, in the early part of um, the gospel, John actually numbers two of the signs that he um, that he is showing us. So in chapter 2, 11, he refers to the, K uh, the incident Cana in Galilee as the first of the signs that, um, that Jesus performs. Um, and John, in, John is sorry, in 4 verse 54, he says this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So he uses this language of sign quite a bit. And we did also already also encounter it um, yesterday in chapter 20, verse 31, um, where 
when I talked about the purpose of why the gospel was written, he says this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. So sign is an important idea in John's thinking. And he shows us in particular seven signs that Jesus does. So they are changing the water into wine, um, chapter two, healing the nobleman's son, chapter four, healing um, the, uh, the man at the pool of Bethesda or Bethsaida at, in chapter five, feeding the multitude in chapter six, walking in the, on the water also in chapter six, healing the man born blind in chapter nine and raising Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. So John has given us these seven signs which are supposed to point us to who Jesus is. Um, and along with those seven signs, then we also have seven discourses, seven prolonged rabbinical discussions, rabbinic type discussions. Jesus certainly was a, a rabbi, would have been viewed as a rabbi, um, which uh, where, where John takes us into this quite, um, quite discursive um, sorts of conversation that were happening. And they are these ones. Um, the, a conversation around new birth in chapter three, a conversation around the water of life in chapter four, um, a conversation around the divine son in chapter five, around the bread of life in chapter six, around the life giving spirit in chapter seven, around the light of the world in chapter eight, and around the good shepherd in chapter 10. Now then, let's talk a little bit about the theological themes um, in this book. In other words, what is John trying to show us? Now, we could talk at great length because there are many, and as I've said, this is a complex and rich and uh, glorious book. But let me show you some of them. Um, John has um, what theologians call high Christology, and what we say when we mean high Christology. Christology is, is um, a view of who the Christ is, and when we say high Christology, we are saying that um, a very high view of who, who, who the Christ is, in particular, um, a view of his power and his transcendence and his relationship with God. So later on in church history, now I'm not a church historian, so I'm painting a very broad brush strokes here, um, but there were two great councils, um, the Council of Nicaea in 325 and, and thereabouts, and the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And in these two great church councils, the church sought to clarify what it believed um, about who Jesus was. And in particular, thinking about questions um, such as the nature of Jesus, was he fully God pretending to be human? Was he fully human um, pretending to be God? Was he fully human kind of adopted within the Godhead? Was he um, kind of part human and part God? Complex, complex questions. And they were kind of hammering these out at these great councils, but they weren't inventing theology at that point. They were trying to discern what had been handed down from the very first time. And the Gospel of John was very, very important to them as they um, tried to hammer these things out. And through the Gospel of John in particular, they came to the conclusion, which is which is now absolutely central to Orthodox Christianity. I, I use the word Orthodox in its in its um, it's, it's lowercase o sense. And so I don't mean the, the Orthodox Church as opposed to the other denominations. I mean um, Orthodox Christianity. So this is central to Orthodox Christianity, is this assertion, this belief that Jesus Christ is fully human and fully God, not a part and part, not half and half, um, but both at once. Um, and uh, two, um, two natures um, in one person. Um, and we see this in John's gospel. So the deity of Jesus. Again, we could talk for ages about this, but let me show you some points. I hear people talking sometimes about having arguments with Jehovah's Witnesses on the doorstep um, about um, the very beginning of John's gospel, where it says in my tra English translation, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And um, I hear people having arguments um, based on this. Um, and that makes me very uncomfortable for a number of reasons. <laughs> number one is I don't believe that anybody has ever argued into the kingdom of God. 
Um, there are we can certainly have conversations with people. We can certainly um, have differences of opinion and discussion. But the idea of arguing somebody into converting to um, being a Christian is um, is is I think offensive. Um, number two, which is very closely related, is I actually don't think that we have we are permitted to use any means of evangelism that do not look like Jesus Christ himself. Um, and so I don't see this kind of aggressive evangelism as being um, reflective of the nature of, of Jesus as I discover him in the Gospels. And therefore, I do not believe that these methods are appropriate to use. But there's a third reason why I don't think that standing on the doorstep, arguing with Jehovah's Witnesses about John chapter one, verse one is helpful. And that is that actually, if you look at the Greek and what we tend, I tend to see is that people who have a little Greek um, jump on this and say, well, that proves that, that John is claiming Jesus is God. Um, and people who have more Greek actually say, mm, it doesn't prove it at all. This is not the strongest argument for the deity of Jesus Christ. So in other words, there are two different ways of translating this. And um, the word was God is the one that I happen to believe is correct, but I'm not going um, to, it would be dishonest to say that that is the only way that this could be translated. Um, and without going into more technical detail, I'm going to ask you to take my word for that. So in other words, I believe that John 1 verse 1, the word was God, the word, of course, sorry, this Greek word logos is referring to Jesus. Um, when we say the word was God, um, I believe it is asserting the deity of Jesus, but not as um, incontrovertibly as people who like to stand on the doorsteps arguing with Jehovah's Witnesses do. However, there are other very, very strong indicators in John's Gospel and elsewhere. One of the things to say in general about this is that when you look at the things that um, God does, the things that characterise what God does, um, such as forgive sins and such as um, create, um, then we see those the New Testament writers very clearly um, showing Jesus doing those things. And when they show Jesus doing the things that only God can do, they are making a very high claim about Jesus being God himself. And um, we see some of that in John and some of that elsewhere. So please don't hear me saying that, um, that I want you to have less confidence in the deity of Jesus, only to say that John 1.1 1, 1 is not the best piece of evidence that we have for that. Let me show you what I think is one of the best pieces of evidence. And this is John 8. Um, let me just turn to it a second. So in John 8, um, beginning at verse 48, um, John has a, uh, so Jesus has a discussion with um, the Jewish leaders. Um, and uh, it culminates in this. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, first of all, on the you know the very surface, the very clear surface is that Abraham lived, I don't know, was it 2000 years or something before Jesus? And Jesus is saying before Abraham was, I am. That means he's claiming pre-existence. He's claiming ancient pre-existence, um, which is itself a claim to, to deity because only God um, has that has that ancient pre-existence. But more significantly than that is this language of I am. So I am um, is what God himself calls himself in the Old Testament. It is it's what lies at the root of the four letter name of God, which is translated as the Lord in capitals in your Bible. Um, this name of God, which is so holy that um, devout Jews um, don't say it, um, or write it well they, they if they write it in scripture then certainly the old, the old tribal scribal traditions were if you wrote the name of, of, of um, or that four letter name of God in the Bible then you had a kind of ritual bath I believe before you wrote it it was so holy and here Jesus is using this language of himself truly truly I say to you before Abraham was I am. So he's claiming eternal pre-existence, but more than that, he is using this divine name about himself. And how can we be absolutely confident that that's what he's doing? Because, next verse, they picked up stones to throw at him. This is the, this is the punishment for blasphemy. He's used stone somebody. And as soon as Jesus says these words, they try to stone him. So the, the, his, his enemies are in no doubt at all that he is making a claim to godhood. 
Um, and this is one of the strongest pieces of, of, of evidence, along with lots of other stuff that I've shown you and other stuff I haven't had time to show you, that Jesus is represented here as being God himself. Um, he's also as part of this high Christology, part of these transcendent claims, um, he's revealed as being the only way to God and the revealer of the Father. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father and, and so on. Very high claims that he makes in this gospel. So this is part of this high Christology that um, that John shows us. Um, but John also shows us um, that Jesus is fully human and he is not. John never emphasises the or overall he doesn't emphasise the transcendence and the deity of Jesus at the expense of showing us Jesus's humanity. So the, the Jesus that John shows to us is is extremely human. He gets tired. He gets thirsty. He shows a lot of human emotions. Um, he experiences pain. Um, these are all very human things and things that we might not immediately understand as being, um, well, with things that we wouldn't understand as being um, things that God would demonstrate, hunger and thirst and, and, and tiredness and so on and grief. Let me say a little bit about glory. Glory is a very important theme in this gospel and it's um, quite a complex one. Uh, I want to show you just some elements of it. So, uh, chapter one, verse 14, a verse I'm going to come back to again in a minute. And we've come back to it several, we've referred to it several times already. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So here John is making this extraordinary claim. Um, I'll, sh I'll tell you a bit more about it in a minute. But for now, let's say he's making this extraordinary claim that Jesus is the glory of the Father. Let me just let that sit for a moment. Jesus is the glory of the Father. OK, the next thing to show you is that the signs um, which I've already referred to point to the glory of God. So, for example, about the first sign, Jesus says this. Uh, sorry, John says this. Um, this was the first of his miraculous signs that Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Um, also, the same language is used about the raising of Lazarus, um, which is referred to as happening in order that um, that the disciples might see the glory of God. So the, the signs are pointers to the glory or, or the glory is manifested in the signs. OK, what else can we say about glory in this gospel? Well, the sun brings glory to the father. Not only is the son the glory of the father, but then in his being and in his actions, he gives glory to the father. Just one of the places we see this in chapter eight, verse uh, 49. Jesus says, I honour my father and you dishonour me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. And then in verse 54, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. So the, the glory of the Father and the Son are closely um, related. And then just a little later, uh, what verse is this? Chapter 12, oh, actually, yeah, sorry, chapter 12, that's right. Um, Jesus says this, speaking about his resurrection. Well, I think and, his, and the cross and resurrection. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice comes from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And the crowd hear it and think that they have heard thunder. And then for John, the glory of Jesus and hence the glory of God is shown most supremely at the cross itself. Now, let's just um, think about that for a moment, because um, I think we can probably see very easily, really, that a crucified man is anything but glorious. A, cru a man who has been flayed by the by the scourge and is just pinned up naked to gasp and vomit his way to death is is there's nothing glorious about that in human terms but even more than that crucifixion was something we don't necessarily understand uh, in the 21st century is that crucifixion was a uh, an unbelievably shameful way to die. 
um, it has it had this kind of shameful symbolism attached to it that we don't um, immediately get. Um, there's a story about a Roman actor who um, represented a crucified man in a in a stage play. And when the play had finished, no one would have him around to dinner anymore because he had represented a crucified man. That's, that's kind of how shameful this crucifixion thing was. Um, and so bearing that in mind, the fact that Jesus, um, the fact that John shows us that Jesus is glorified um, at the cross, most supremely at the cross, is stunning. And yet it is absolutely what John is showing us. Um, so chapter 13, Jesus, uh, just as Judas leaves, so just on the night before he dies, Judas goes out and then Jesus says, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the son in himself and will glorify him at once. Now, I wonder if you remember something that I said when we looked at Isaiah, which uh, is quite a long time ago, I appreciate Isaiah 6 is Isaiah's vision of um, God filling the heavens and the earth with his glory. Um, and the vision of God that he has at that moment is of, of God high and lifted up. And then we saw that that same language of being high and lifted up was used by Isaiah in Isaiah 53, which is about the suffering servant. So God in glory and the suffering servant being high and lifted up are are probably linked by Isaiah, but certainly are being linked by John. So um, Jesus speaks again and again about being lifted up um, and about that being the means by which he would draw everyone to himself. And then in John 12, he brings together those two passages from Isaiah to show us glory and the suffering in one, um, in one wonderful kind of nugget. Um, so when Jesus had said these things, this is John 12, 38, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could, that was from Isaiah 4, 53. Therefore, they could not believe, says John. And then for again, Isaiah has said, and this is when he quotes from chapter six. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. And so John, with great theological astuteness, is bringing together this glory, this transcendent vision of the glory of God and the suffering of servant. And he's bringing them both together in Jesus and saying by his suffering, Jesus is glorified extraordinary extraordinary moment okay i want to sh close by showing you um two extraordinary things that are in this gospel um two of many uh, but something you may not have spotted before john 1 verse 14 i said i was going to come back to it um says this in my translation the word became flesh and dwelt among us now that language of dwelt is translated in different ways um I think the message has it as um, the word became flesh and moved into the neighbourhood. Um, and I'm, I'm very disappointed with that particular translation because it really lessens this um, very significant, uh, the significant meaning of this. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That, language, that word dwelt um, is tabernacle language. So a better translation, although perhaps difficult to understand, would be the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So remember the tabernacle, the tabernacle, the temple, theologically the same thing, the place where sacrifice is made, the place where forgiveness is obtained, the place where God and humans meet each other. Um, and there is a rich, rich theme, um, which I touched on. Um, I spoke about it in the book of Exodus to some extent when I talked about the presence of God being utterly desirable and yet rather terrifying. Do you remember that? Um, and the tabernacle was a kind of place where that could be mediated, a place where humans and God could kind of be together. And this, this obviously there's then continued in the temple language. The temple was the place where God dwelt. And now here is John showing us 
the word became flesh and tabernacled with us. And do you remember what happened at the consecration of the tabernacle and the consecration of the temple? The glory of God came down and then we have and we have seen his glory. So John is making a claim here, which he actually shows again and again through his gospel, that Jesus is the true temple because Jesus um, in his body, if you like, is the place where God is, the place where humans and God meet. Um, through Jesus, in Jesus, um, is sacri sacrifice is made, um, forgiveness is obtained, the word of God is spoken, and this is all temple function. So Jesus does what the temple did, and this is why the temple becomes redundant at his death. Um, I touched on this again also in Mark, uh, I think in the second of the Mark videos, um, when we looked at Mark 13 briefly. But here um, in John's prologue, John is making this extraordinary claim. The word became flesh and templed with us or tabernacled with us. And if you um, skip on to the resurrection accounts um, at the end of uh, John's gospel, then we get this uh, image. Let's see if I can find the verses um, where they look into the tomb and they see an angel sitting one at each end of where Jesus's body had lain. Can't quite see the verses right now, but uh, you'll find it easily enough if you um, have a quick glance. Um, so they look into the tomb and there's this empty plinth and there is an angel at each end. Now, can you think of something in the Old Testament that had an angel at each side of it? Well, that's the Ark of the Covenant, of course, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat with the, the cherubim sitting with their, their wings overshadowing this empty space. Um, and uh, John is using temple language again to draw our attention to what has happened, the significance of what has happened in these moments of, of death and resurrection. One more thing I want to show you, and I'm aware I'm running out of time. Twice in this resurrection account, John tells us it was the first day of the week. Chapter 20, verse 1, it was the first day of the week. Chapter 20, verse 19, it was the first day of the week. Why does John make this um, make this uh, statement twice? So, why does he think this is so important? Well, the first day of the week, of course, is Sunday and uh, and Saturday was the Sabbath, was the day of rest. So Sunday is the day that God began creating. So Sunday was day one, if you're thinking in terms of Genesis 1. So this is Sunday again. And this is new creation idea. And so do you remember when we looked at Mark 13 a few days ago, I talked about how the, the, the temple that was Jesus's body was destroyed. And, the, and um, Mark combines that with the idea of the whole cosmos being destroyed and the physical temple itself being destroyed and kind of all of these things happen at once. John has the same idea here he's using. The day of resurrection, it's not just another day, it's the first day of the new heavens and the new earth. And in case we miss it, when he says the first day of the week twice, he also shows us a man in a garden who is mistaken by Mary for the gardener. Maybe she didn't mis make a mistake, actually, in one sense, because, of course, the first creation begins with a man in a garden who is the gardener, who is put in charge of it. And here we have a man in a garden on this new first day. And so John is showing us something that I hope I'll be able to pull out for you a little bit more when we look at the letters, that although the, the, the present age continues, that at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the new age has begun. Let me try and get it the right way around for you. Here's the present age continuing. It will one day end, but we haven't got there yet. But at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the new age, which is eternal, goes off the end of your screen, I hope, um, has begun. And we now live in what's known as the time between the times, the time when the new heavens and the new earth have actually begun and yet the old heavens and the old earth are still continuing. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the beginning of that. And we see that in Mark 13 and we see that in John here where he shows us this is the first day of the week. I hope I have inspired you to study John's gospel a little more because it is so wonderful. Tomorrow I'll see you for Acts.